Once a cheater, always a cheater. Steroids may confer long-term effects even after you stop taking them. What's up guys, we're back with another educational video and this week we are talking about steroid use and how it may actually confer long-term benefits way after you stop taking them. But first, you know the drill. Make sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel, and leave a comment for the algorithm. So a really cool new study just came out where they were assessing what's called myonuclei density in current steroid users, former steroid users, and people who have never used steroids before. Let's back up a little bit and talk about myonuclei and myonuclear domain theory. Myonuclei are what they sound like. They are muscle nucleus. So when you're in high school biology and they were teaching about the brain of the cell, the nucleus, these are nuclei in muscle cells. But muscle cells are very unique in that they are the only cell type that has multiple myonuclei. In fact, they can get a lot of myonuclei. And the way that myonuclear density increases is you have these things called satellite cells, which kind of sit on the surface of the muscle cell in the sarcolemma. And as you resistance train or take anabolic steroids, those satellite cells can fuse and donate their myonuclei so that now you have more myonuclei in the muscle cell. Why does that matter? It's thought that the myonuclei number can determine your overall muscular potential. And that's because it's thought that each myonuclei can control protein synthesis for a defined surface area of the muscle cell. Meaning, once your muscle cell gets so big, it can't really get bigger at its set myonuclei because each myonuclei can only control a certain area of protein synthesis. So once you get to that limit, if you don't donate more myonuclei through satellite cell fusion, then you're kind of at your limit. So the more myonuclei you can fuse, the greater the overall muscle you can build. One of the things that we think we know about myonuclear domain theory is, for example, with retraining after untraining or after injury, we call it muscle memory. It's thought that once myonuclei fuse, they don't unfuse. Many of you may have noticed that when you're returning from say an injury or a layoff from training, you build back the muscle faster than it originally took to build it. And it's thought that that is because since those myonuclei are already fused, it takes a much shorter amount of time to get it back because all the framework is already there. You just got to ramp it up. How does this relate to possible steroid use? Well, we know steroids can increase myonuclei density. And so this study was actually looking at Okay, are there actual differences in myonuclei density between current users, former users, and people who have never used? And what they found was myonuclei density was very similar between former and current users. Never users had a lower myonuclei density. They had to have be stopped from using for a minimum of three months, but I think most people had stopped using for like six or even like longer than a year. I think most of them had been not using for a good period of time. They still did have some indices of having more muscle mass, not necessarily lean body mass, but like their lean mass index, they call it. So think about BMI except for lean mass. So the lean mass index was greater in the former users than people who had never used. So the question then becomes, what relevance does this have what does it mean? If you've already fused those myonuclei, it's possible that is still conferring long-term benefits to those former users. There is a mouse study that was done a few years back. One group used anabolic steroids, another group not used anabolic steroids, and had them train. And of course, the group using anabolic steroids built more muscle. After a period of detraining, they had them both go back to training without steroids. And the group that had formerly used steroids built muscle significantly faster than the group that had never used them, which lends credence to some of the information we already have. We know that, again, retraining after detraining, uh, you build it back faster than it originally took to build it. And this idea of myonuclear domain theory, that your overall muscular potential is greater when you have more myonuclei. So here's where this really has ramifications. In various bodybuilding and powerlifting organizations, 
There are rules for you have to be, you know, one year drug free, three years drug free, five years drug free, seven years drug free, or lifetime drug free. I do understand, and I've talked to heads of organizations because I used to compete in drug free bodybuilding. And I personally have never used anabolic steroids. I've never even used pro hormones. I know the brigade out there is going to be like, Rrr! look at pictures of me 10 years ago versus pictures of me now. It's pretty much the same. If I'm on steroids, they're pretty crappy. Like I've been able to get stronger, but a lot of that is through technique and neuromuscular adaptations. And if you look back, I never had a year where I built a ton of muscle. Like it just never happened. In fact, when I turned pro in 2006 to when I did my pro shows in 2010 in bodybuilding, I put on just about three pounds of stage weight in four years. I've talked to heads of these organizations who have said, you know, we don't want to make it lifetime drug free because what if some kid took something in high school that they weren't familiar with, they didn't know what they were doing, and now they can never compete in natural bodybuilding. Totally get that, that thought process. But with this study, it suggests that even if they've been drug free for five or 10 years, that they may still have a long-term advantage versus people who have never used. The other thing, that might get me in trouble, but I feel it's important to address is the conversation around trans athletes in competitive sports. If we look at what is typically recommended and, and what, for example, they have to do if they want to compete in the organizations that allow it, like in the Olympics, um, they have to go on basically hormone therapy that knocks down their levels of testosterone if we're talking about men transitioning to women. They have to knock down those levels of testosterone to a certain range. People born as men or XY chromosome or, or, or however you want to define that, over time they have been, spent a long period of time being exposed to higher levels of testosterone and likely will have more satellite cell fusion and have more myonuclei. So even if you knock that down later in life, they're always going to retain that competitive advantage. At least that would be the theory behind it. We can, if we take an approximation and we look at, like let's take some of the best power lifters who are in similar weight classes, men and women. Because what we tend to see, at least in the research studies, is about a 10% drop off in performance from uh, men when they transition to women. I think 15 is the highest percentage. So let's take powerlifting, for example, because I'm very familiar with it. So if we look at the top performance of the men in the 74, 75 kilogram class, Austin Perkins has a total of 1,876 as his powerlifting total. Now let's look at women in the 76 kilo class. Agata Sitko has the top total of 1,323 pounds. So Austin was 1876, she was 1,323. So that's about a, almost a 30% difference. So the research suggests, at least on average, even if we had a 15 or 20% decrease in performance from Austin, it still wouldn't get you to that. And what we think might explain this would be difference in myonuclear number or myonuclear density. I'm not making any, trying to make any political statements. I'm just evaluating the evidence here. So this is where this stuff and the ramifications come in because it does look like there's some decent evidence to suggest steroids can infer long-term benefits. It also highlights the point that the way organizations drug test is important because some organizations will only drug test the day of the competition. Well, most of these compounds go through your system in a few days, some in a few weeks, some in a few months. But organizations like in powerlifting, for example, the IPF, they randomly drug test throughout the year. So if you are a world level lifter in the IPF, they put you into a pool and they will randomly drug test you. And I can attest to that. When I was in the testing pool for them, I was actually doing a seminar in Virginia and their USA affiliate the, at the time, which is USAPL, was right next door doing a powerlifting meet. And in between one of my seminars, one of the officials came over and grabbed me and they were like, hey Lane, while you're here, pee in this cup. It's not a perfect system, but that is probably the best system for keeping people honest when it comes to that stuff. Because if you know you can be drug tested at any one time, it makes trying to time this stuff uh, for people who would cheat a lot more difficult. Or you could just do the right thing and choose to compete in an organization that doesn't drug test, which at least in powerlifting and bodybuilding, you have those options. So that's all I got to say about that. Hope you guys liked the video and I will catch you next week.